So a prepared introduction sounds a lot more formal than what it actually is. It's just a slide that says, hi, I'm Nathan. Uh, that's me. So I am from Birmingham, Alabama, where it is exactly the same weather as it is here, which is not right in some way. Uh, I got here, my wife said, so is it cold there? And I'm like, yeah, it's like 30 degrees, but it's a dry cold. <laughs> yeah. It did work. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah. Uh, I actually did say that. She didn't think it was funny, but I said, that, they'll probably think it's funny here. Maybe not. So uh, I am the lead organizer for WordCamp Birmingham. I love WordCamps. I did 10 WordCamps last year, probably do 12 this year, all across the country, and I'm really, really excited to be with you guys today. I'm the host at iThemes Training, which, how many of you are familiar with iThemes? We do Backup Buddy, iThemes Security, a number of other plugins. Okay, so uh, we do, it's like WordCamp all year long. It's webinars, one to three webinars a week all year long. So I do, uh, I present some and I host all of them. I have been a freelance business owner since 1995 which means I'm a geezer when it comes to all things tech. Uh, you know, I started coding websites when the internet was just beginning to walk upright. So I've used all the tools in the world and moved to WordPress about 2010. Love, love WordPress, love the community. Uh, I started as a business coach for WordPress freelancers a few years ago, and that is a passion of mine. So let's talk about why we're here, which is how many of you are business owners or freelancers or somebody working with clients? How many of you enjoy working with clients? Okay, depends on the client, right? Okay, now that's another talk altogether, but uh, what we're going to talk about today is something that I feel is very important, and that is how many of you do something like, hey, we're sitting down over a cup of coffee talking about your website for the first time? A meeting with the client. <clears throat> that's what I call the client consultation. And if you're not careful, you can really end up wasting a lot of time. So uh, I call it the scope strategy, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But it's really how to master the client consultation, get the most out of that time that you're investing with the client. So one morning, I'm sitting in a coffee shop, <clears throat> and I'm meeting with this brand new person I just met over the phone once, and we're talking about his website. And I think, you know, this is a person that really has some potential. Have you ever had that feeling? You know, you meet with somebody, you're kind of clicking, the coffee's good, you're talking. And I realize it's been 45 minutes, and this guy's still talking about his dog that escaped from the fence last night. And how he's wandering the neighborhood. Now, I love dogs. Well, we have two. They're both rescues. I love dogs. But I don't love dogs 45 minutes worth in a coffee shop with somebody I bet you barely know, right? That's not why I'm here. So it's been like 45 minutes, and when we finally get around to the website... This guy doesn't know what he wants, what he needs, what his budget is. He has no clue. You ever had a conversation like that? So have you ever spent hours talking to a client and gotten nowhere in a first meeting? Okay, so one day I'm sitting in my car, and I've just finished meeting with a client. I think the meeting has gone very, very well, and I'm convinced I'm going to get the project. Have you been there? You know you had this great meeting, or it's a great phone call, and you, I, mean, I got this one. We're going to get this one signed. And, you know, I'm sort of doing a happy dance as, as much as a person can while sitting in a car. And then it hits me, like, you know that feeling you get? It's like a splash of cold water, like, oh, crap. I forgot to talk anything about maintenance services for their WordPress website. And if I've learned something over the years, it's that if you don't start talking about the maintenance contract in the first conversation, you're never going to sell it. So I thought, ah, oh, I missed it. So have you ever left a meeting with a client and realized that you forgot to cover something important for the project. Ever done it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm sitting there checking my email one day, and I'm waiting on a, a reply from a client that I'd sent a proposal to. And, you know, this was a proposal that, to be quite frankly, I was, I was a little nervous about. And I spent hours, anybody spend hours pouring over the proposal, making sure all the adjectives are right, you know? And then you're tweaking the pricing, right? Okay, should I charge... $3,500, or maybe it should be $3,800, no, $3,775, because they say sevens are good in pricing, right? So you get all the psych and you, you psychological stuff with pricing, and you're arguing around yourself, and you've spent three hours on this proposal, and then I get the email back from the client. I'm all excited. After I'd spent hours agonizing, the reply from the client was, well, I was thinking it was going to be like 750 bucks. Ever had that conversation? So have you ever spent time agonizing over a proposal like that only to discover you were way off the client's price point? If you haven't, then you're awesome. Because this, th those are three scenarios that I hear all the time from freelancers. So 
This is why I'm talking this morning. You desperately need a strategy for client consultations. Desperately. So what we're going to talk about today is, the, first of all, the purpose of a client consultation, and then what I call the SCOPE strategy. It's an acronym, and that acronym will keep you on track through the course of a client consultation. You won't forget anything. So, uh, by the way, I'll pause for questions at the end of each section. I don't know how much time we're going to have. This is usually like an hour, so we'll see where we are on time. Maybe we'll do questions. Definitely questions at the end when we have time. But if you're a freelancer or a business owner, uh, let's have lunch today. Seriously, let's get a table full of people, you know, other like-minded business owners. Let's just talk about WordPress business, okay? So find me at lunch. Let's talk. Okay, so why do we need the scope strategy? We need the scope strategy to take control of the client meeting. You are spending your time with this client. You're not being paid for it yet. So you are spending time. You've got to think about your time that way. You're spending time to meet with the client, so you've got to make that time count, right? So let's talk about the purpose. Why are we here? What are we doing? And really, I find a lot of times that when you're trying to figure out what you're doing, it's better to start with what you shouldn't be doing. So this is what the client consultation is not. The client consultation is not you trying to sell a website. You got to get that thought out of your mind. The first meeting with a client, think of it like a first date because you got to figure out if this relationship is going to work or not. How many of you have taken bad clients? That's all, really? Nobody else has had bad clients? I've had like 80. Okay, so... In that first conversation, you gotta make sure this thing's gonna work. Don't go in there trying to sell a website because you're gonna miss all the red flags the client throws in that conversation. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. The client consultation is not to refine the client's business plan. If you've ever spent time with a client over coffee helping them hammer out what they're actually trying to do, this is not, you're not being paid for this yet. This is a consultation to figure out what the website is supposed to be, not what the client and their business is supposed to be. Now, that's a separate service that you may or may not be able to offer, but that's not the purpose of the initial consultation. It's also, and this is a good way to think of it in your mind, the initial consultation is not to answer how questions. You're there to discover the what of what needs to happen. Does that make sense? The how comes later after a check has been cashed. The what is what you're doing in that initial client consultation. And by the way, the link I'm going to give you at the end has all the slides. So if you're furiously scribbling down, you'll be able to download all these slides as a PDF, no worries. Uh, also, when we get to the strategy, there's a one-pager I'm going to give you with all the questions on there. So you don't have to scribble. So this is what the consultation is not. What is it really about? Here's the five purposes of the client consultation. And it's wrapped up in this acronym of SCOPE. And what we're going to do is go through, first of all, just what those letters stand for. Then we're going to spend some time on each section, okay? So the S in scope is really easy to remember. It stands for scope. How about that? Easy, right? So S in scope stands for scope. You need to learn enough about the project to create a proposal. For most of us, that's where the, it stops. But there's four more steps that we need to take into account. So first scope, that's what you're probably used to when you sit down with a client. The C is chemistry. You need to determine if this is a client that you can really work with or not. Okay, the O in scope is ongoing services. Explain the importance of your ongoing services. And let me just say this, you do have ongoing services, right? You're offering WordPress maintenance plans and hosting maybe and whatever. Because if you're not, I promise you, it is virtually impossible to be successful in a WordPress business as a freelancer if you're not offering some sort of ongoing recurring revenue. That's another talk. The P in scope is process. Set expectations with a potential client by walking them through the process that you'd make to build a website. By the way, do you have a process that you use for every client, every project, every time? If you don't, you should. E is estimate, and this is the secret sauce. Provide a ballpark estimate and get client buy-in. I'm going to get more into that. Now, using this method, and see, I hate to, I always struggle over whether to put this slide in or not. Literally, at the back during the radio show this morning, I was deciding whether or not I was going to put this slide in because I don't want it to feel like oily, salesy, you know, whatever. But honestly, this process works. I closed over 90% of the proposals that I made last year using this process. Okay, so not trying to be oily, salesy, but it does work. 
Okay, let's dig into the S in scope. And this is where we're going to spend the most of our time because this is where all the questions are to uncover all the hidden landmines in this project that you may or may not be about to take on. So in the S in scope, we're trying to learn enough about the project to create a proposal. So here are the, there are five main buckets of questions. This is the way I like to visualize this. As you are um, looking at this conversation, five buckets of questions. Now, you can go in and out of these buckets as you want to just to make the conversation natural. You can make it structured. You can make it whatever you want to make it. But these five buckets need to be covered in the scope conversation. So the business purpose website launch and budget. So, and I would say, look, you need to create some sort of a checklist for yourself for every conversation, or you're gonna forget something. How many of you forget something if you don't have a checklist? Because I sure do. If pilots who've been flying for 30 years still run a checklist to take off and to land or whatever, I need a checklist, no matter how long I've been doing this. Okay, so let's talk about the business. This is the first bucket. The business bucket starts to ask some questions that I find most freelancers don't ask in a client consultation, which is, Hey, what's your elevator pitch or coffee shop answer when somebody wants to know what it is that you do? How do you answer? What do you do? What do you make? What is your competition? Who's your ideal customer? Why, do you, why should they choose you instead of the competition? Now, uh, there's a few more here as well. What's your price point? How do your customers find you now? Do you have a brand identity? Now, your goal in asking these kinds of questions is to figure out, do they really understand their business or not? Because I've had lots of conversations with clients that have this grand idea that is simply an idea with no plan to get there. And if you, it's, it's impossible to be successful building a website when the client themselves don't understand what they're even trying to accomplish. Now let me, let me caveat that by saying you can build a website. I mean, you can, we can all build a website, right? But it may or may not be successful. And whether you're successful in the website or not depends on what the client's goals are and if they've articulated them to the place where you can actually reach them. So, you know, the client may not be ready for a website yet, and that's okay. If not, suggest some sort of consulting arrangement. Maybe you can help the client figure those things out or work with a marketing person that can help the client figure those things out. But the business bucket is all about figuring out does the client understand what he or she is really trying to do. Then we get into the actual purpose bucket. How does the web fit into your marketing strategy? Is it like, you know, we hope if we build it, they will come? It doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, how does this fit in? Why should your ideal customer come to your site? What are your goals for your website? So the goal in this bucket of questions is to figure out how much strategy assistance am I going to have to provide to the client? Uh, is that going to be part of this proposal or not? And again, the client may not be ready, so it may be time to suggest a discovery phase, which is essentially just another scope of work where you're going to say, we're going to answer these five questions. It's going to cost you this much. And at the end, here's a document with all the answers. From that, we can build your website. Now we get to the part of the bucket of questions, which is where most people start and end, which is just, what do we want the website to be and to do? And you're probably already asking questions like this. Do you have a domain name? Who's our point of contact? Uh, where is content for the site going to come from? That's a loaded question, isn't it? How many of you have had clients that expect that you, the web professional, are going to provide all the content for the website? Yeah, it's not the way it should work. Um, yeah, so roughly how many pages is the site going to include? We need to kind of know, is this a five-page brochure site? Or is this like, Danelle has a site where there's eight million capacitors, right? <laughs> Seriously, talk to her about that. 7,000. <laughs> 7, Who wants to do that site? 7,000 capacitors. That's, yeah. Uh, so... Are, are they going to be blogging or sharing news items? Are they going to be selling things online? Do they need an event calendar? Do the clients need to log in for any reason? Because that's a very deep and dark burrow that we have to go down. Uh, are you going to use social media? Which networks? Do you have videos, testimonials? By the way, do you have the testimonials already? Because that can take four months. Is there any third-party integration at all that's going to be required? Uh, should the website simply be a credibility piece? Or do you want to generate leads from search results? If you write down one question, write down that one. Because what you'll find is many, a lot of people don't want to spend the money on SEO. And guess what? Sometimes that's okay. 
WordPress does pretty well out of the box with SEO, everything's structured correctly. And a lot of clients don't have the infrastructure to handle 100 calls a day. They want to have a nice piece that if they're out talking somewhere, that here's my domain name and this site gives credibility to who I am. So it's a good question to ask. Aside from communicating information, is there anything else the website needs to do? I always end the conversation with that question. Have we missed anything? So the goal here is to create that solid scope of work in the proposal that we're going to give to the client. Then we move into the launch bucket. And again, I'm going to give you all these questions on the one pager, so don't worry about scrolling these down. Do we have a deadline? How do you handle email? Have you ever gotten to the point where you're launching a website and you realize, oh, oh, the client has 86 email addresses on their old cPanel hosting system. And now we've got to move all that stuff somehow. And oh Lord, am I going to have to set up all those new email addresses on client computers? No thank you. Uh, by the way, how many of you do email for your clients? Good. Not many. Email will drive you absolutely insane. I quit doing email for clients about three years ago because I realized, actually four years ago, I realized that 80% of my support inquiries were I got a new iPhone and I can't set up my email. Email is an IT issue, not a web design issue. By the way, that's a great answer for the client. Uh, who's going to be responsible for maintaining the site after it's been launched? That's a great little segue into the section on ongoing services. So your goal here is to determine time frame, start the discussion about those ongoing services. Then we get to the B word, the budget. So do you have a ballpark budget for this project? If it's a low budget, can we simplify things? Nothing wrong with working with a client that has a low budget if it's a reasonable scope for the money. Maybe we can phase things in. What's the decision making process and you actually deciding who's going to build your website? When do you expect to make the final decision? You're trying to figure out here, am I wasting time with this person or not? Most web developers that I've worked with or talked with struggle talking about money with the client. Does that sound familiar? And we kind of avoid it. You got to start getting comfortable with talking about money with the client. It's okay. You're here to make money. We love what we do, but we do what we do to make money, right? I mean, ultimately. Got to put food on the table. So make sure you're not wasting money with the client. Get into the budget conversation. All right, we have successfully passed the S in scope. Everybody still with me? That was like the fire hose of questions, which I'm going to give you on the one pager. But you see how this is structured, right? We're going to ask a whole bunch of questions about the scope. Now we're going to get into the intangible part of chemistry. Is this a client I can actually work with? Now the C is second because the most of your conversation with the client is going to be had through the S, through the scope, fleshing out what this website is supposed to be and do. And by the end of that conversation, which probably will take 45 to 50 minutes of the hour that you'll spend with the client, you'll have, you should have a good feeling of, is this a person I can work with or not? Does that make sense? So we've kind of worked through the process. Now we're just kind of making a call. Do I have chemistry with this person or not? And if I do, great, let's keep on going. If I don't, nice to meet you, we'll talk someday, <laughs> right? Or you know, maybe you have a, the business card of a web developer in your area that you don't like, that you hand to that client. No, I would never do that. <laughs> Probably not, but <clears throat> I would never do that. Uh, so here's just a couple of suggestions. When you get to chemistry, listen. Listen as you're asking those scope questions. Ask a question and then shut up and listen to what the client says, but not only what the client says, but how they say it. Watch for red flags, because by the end of that scope phase, you want to have a good feeling whether, uh, you know, whether this is a good person or not. Here's a couple common red flags that I see a lot of times with clients. The first is unanswered questions. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but you know, the client doesn't know what they need. This is a red flag. Uh, and again, that discovery phase is a really great first step for a lot of clients. Just un unanswered questions are not necessarily bad. But gosh, if you're trying to build a website and there's a huge question mark over what this whole thing is going to be and do, then the chance of that client, I've been waiting to say this, taking a left turn at Albuquerque in the middle of the project <laughs> is high. <clears throat> How about this one? Disrespectfulness. If the client is a jerk when you're talking to them, this person is on a first date. Think about that. 
you're getting the best version of the client in this conversation that you'll ever get. Seriously. If the client is a jerk in the initial consultation, if they don't listen, if they interrupt, if they won't answer your questions, if they start nickel and diming you already, red flag. If there are scheduling problems, if the client reschedules that initial call or meeting two or three times, that, that habit does not change throughout the project. That client will become what I call the invisible man who disappears halfway through the project and reappears six months later with unreasonable demands to get that project accomplished at a certain time frame. So again, you know, there are legitimate reasons for scheduling issues, sure, but just it's a red flag, watch it. Uh, complaining. <laughs> If the client had a previous web developer who did everything wrong, you want to dig into that like big time. Because chances are it's not the client. Now there are some knucklehead web developers out there and maybe you guys have gotten rescue work from developers who evaporated and did stupid things. Whatever it is about our profession, it draws those kinds of people in. But if the client is constantly complaining about this mysterious web developer who did everything wrong, it's also very likely that if you take this project in six months, that client is going to be sitting across from someone else at a coffee shop telling them how terrible you were. Because some people just can't be satisfied. Dig into that. Emergencies. The client needs everything immediately. Or there's lots of drama. If everything the client says has an exclamation, uh, exclamation point behind it, careful with that one. Again, there can be legitimate reasons for emergencies, but it's a red flag. And here's a couple of frequent mistakes I see people making in context of identifying these red flags in the chemistry section. The first is what I call running a red light, and that is thinking that that red flag is no big deal, or making excuses for the client. Do you ever do that in the back of your mind? Oh, I realize this is kind of weird, but we make our own excuses for why the client might be doing this, or whatever, and because we really, we, we want to sell a website and make things work. But if you take a bad client, if you take a bad client, You'll never, you'll never, rec doesn't matter how much money that you make from this client, you will always spend more in emotional capital in dealing with a bad client. Always. So red flags are icebergs in this conversation. You only see the tip, there's a whole lot more beneath the surface. So don't run a red light, don't disregard the red flags. The second is what I call the hero syndrome. I'm, I'm fleshing this out, this will eventually be a talk, but I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there are probably people in this room who understand what I say, that you have the perpetual need to fix the client. And this is usually not confined just to the business part of your world. You have a need to fix people. And if you try to run your business that way, you'll never have a successful business. You just can't do it. There's no way. It's sort of a client codependency. Ultimately, it will wreck your business. So be aware of the hero syndrome. Okay, so we've gotten through scope. We've gotten through chemistry. The client gets a thumbs up. This is a person I think I can work with. Now we get to the O in scope, which is the ongoing services. This is the part of the conversation where we explain the importance of our ongoing services. When you're selling website management services, education is the key. You will not be able to survive long term as a freelance web developer or WordPress business owner if you do not have some component of your business wrapped up in recurring revenue. You just can't do it. If you're trying to live by selling websites, it'll work for a while, but you'll peter out. Matter of fact, I'm just about convinced that many of these disappearing web developers we hear a lot about are good, well-meaning people who tried to build their business just selling websites and they couldn't do it so now they're working for somebody else and their clients are on the hook because they can't find their web developer. They've gone and got a job, a real job somewhere, real job. <laughs> Freelance web developers are people who are willing to work 60 hours a week to avoid having to work 40. And if that's your heart and passion, you are my kind of person. Okay. So you're not asking for commitment yet. You're simply explaining, hey, WordPress is awesome. However, it has to be taken care of. It's got to be managed. Just has to. So, and I always tell people, look, we provide you training on how to do it yourself, or we provide a white glove service. Okay. Ongoing services have to be discussed in that first conversation, I promise you. If you have trouble selling recurring services, if you move that discussion to the very first conversation, I promise you'll convert more clients. Okay, P, the process. 
Set expectations with the client by walking through your process. And I, I mentioned this earlier because I think it's critical for every freelance web developer to have a consistent process that they use for every client, every project, every time. I've got another talk on this. There's information about that on my website. But uh, you've got to have a consistent process. If you get consistent with a consistent theme and plugin stack, with a way that method that you work every project, you will become more efficient, more effective, and more profitable. It just will happen. So you got to get this process. And yeah, every client, every project, every time. So talk it through with the client. This is the way I build websites. Explain the steps that are involved. Explain the tools that you use. Set expectations early. So I explain to the client, I've got a friend in Atlanta, and I, I use this phrase at every WordCamp talk I do because it's just, I mean, genius. This is one of those guys that you're talking to him, and he just says something, and you're like, boom, that's like mic drop. You know, this is, and, he, and, and he's like, what did I just say? And he's one of these guys that just, you know, spews that kind of incredible wisdom. And he made a statement to me a couple years ago. He said, you know, we've moved our process around so that we don't do any code before content. No code before content. It's beautiful. Think about it. If you could start to build a website and you had all the assets 100% at the beginning, how quickly could you build that website? But instead, what do we do? It's six months later and we're still waiting on the dadgum group picture of the employees in the business, right? Or we're waiting on the text for the about page still three months later. No code before content. So our process is, look, when you sign our contract, you're going to get back from us a document, and that's going to be your to-do list for all the content of the website. We don't move another inch until all of that content and assets is complete and delivered. When we do that, then we give you a design, then we build a site out, then we launch it, and we get client input at every point. But this is the way we build sites. So the expectations are set early. Make sense? Scope, chemistry, Ongoing services, we're talking through our process and how we do things. Now comes the secret sauce, the estimate. How many of you give an estimate to the client at that first conversation, or do you wait and surprise them with that number in a proposal later? For years, it was the surprise number in the proposal, hoping that the client and I were magically in the same wavelength of what this price ought to be. So here's what I do. I give a ballpark estimate at the end of every client consultation. By this point, you ought to know, you ought to have a feeling in your bones about roughly what a site like this should cost. And so I end the conversation with something like this. Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, uh, based on what we've said, this project feels like about a five to $6,000 project. If I come back to you with a proposal in that price range, are you ready to start? So at, that first con at this first conversation, before I ever write the proposal, I'm going to get a buy-in from the client on about a $1,000 range. And proposals contain no surprises. It's always going to come back in that range. Now, the tricky part here is understanding you know, what this kind of thing ought to take, you know, how much it ought to, um, you know, what, what, a, what the number should be. And you'll get it wrong sometimes. Sometimes you'll go too low. Sometimes you'll go too high. It all gets, you know, it comes out in the wash, and you get better at it over time. But if you do this, this is what this is going to avoid. That reply back from the client that said, I was expecting 750 bucks. The kid next door to me said he'd do it for 500 <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> the ballpark estimate will save you more time. Now, was that 10 minutes until I'm at, we're like, next session? Okay. All right, so I have 10 more minutes to talk, and then we have 10 more minutes after that. Okay, so we have time for questions. That's great. So getting client buy-in uh, starts with a question something like this, and if they say, no, I'm not ready to start, I need to dig into why. Do you have to get three more bids? You know, um, are you looking for a $2,000 website, not a $6,000 website? You know, we need to have that conversation now, right? If you do that, this is what I did. 90% of my proposals last year that I wrote were closed. And the 10% that didn't are just on hold. Hopefully they'll materialize this year. So that is the scope strategy. Uh, we have eight minutes or so for questions. So here's my website, nathaningram.com slash WCABQ. Uh, that page has 
all the slides. It has the one pager of all the questions from the scope process on there, uh, which you can use as is or refine it to your business. You can find me always at training.ithings.com two or three times a week. We do webinars there, and let's do that table talk. So questions right here. Um, when you're giving that ballpark estimate, um, are you also estimating the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance? Great. Okay. So I tell. So the question was for the video. Uh, do does the ballpark estimate also include the cost of maintenance? And yeah, I always when I give them when I'm on the O and I'm talking about ongoing services. Typically for us, a maintenance client for a typical non-e-commerce, no members logging in, basic website's about 100 bucks a month. And so I tell them that. Yeah, so you're saying ballpark plus $100 bucks sure. a month for Yeah, this, this feels like a five to $6,000 project. You know, also the maintenance cost, we've talked about that already. Yeah, good question. Yes? So if you're gonna start putting uh, maintenance services too, doesn't that start eating to your capacity as a, to do development work, design work? You're it can. Depends on how you're structured. So what do I do? I don't, I don't want to offer it and then get bogged down and be some kind of a maintenance monkey the rest of my life. Okay, so, let's, so the question is, doesn't maintenance work eat into your time as a developer? So you gotta define what's included in maintenance work. Uh, for us, the basic package is gonna be uh, hosting on our server, it's gonna be a daily WordPress backup, weekly WordPress plugin updates, and a security plugin installed and monitored. About $100 a month. That's no content changes, no content edits. If they want content edits, we do that a couple of different ways, but that's more money. Uh, you know, so at that point, you know, if you're small, you're servicing 20 or 30 clients, you're not gonna hear from most of your clients every month, first of all. But as you start to grow bigger, you've got that recurring revenue piece in, you can afford to hire somebody to come in and do some basic client maintenance for you. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. It is. Questions? Really? Right back, in the back. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I understand the question. In other words, how do you position your services versus some... Oh, okay. Yeah, why should... Okay, so the question is, how can a freelance web developer... I'm going to paraphrase your question. How can a freelance web developer survive in the world of Wix and Squarespace? Is that your question? Yes. Okay. We shall not speak ill of GoDaddy because they are a global sponsor. Uh, and there are other, also lots of other web developing companies. The GoDaddy, by the way, if anybody in this room has a poor opinion of GoDaddy, you need to look at what they're doing today. Go look, go talk to Mendel. GoDaddy's doing some pretty cool stuff these days. Okay, so the Wix and Squarespace question. How many of you run up against that or you're worried about it yourself? Okay, a lot of people, I mean, whenever I talk to a group, a lot of, this is a big worry. So here's the answer. Have you ever, so if you're, if you're watching a commercial and you know, Wix has this beautiful commercial and these beautiful websites people are building on Wix, have you ever seen one really? Like that an per, actual person has built themselves? It's pretty horrible. It really is pretty horrible. And it's like, okay, you know, I could go to Home Depot and like buy a kitchen tile and do it myself or I could hire a professional. Because if I do it myself, like there's gonna be some that are like off and like smeared caulk everywhere. I mean, that, it's not gonna go well. I mean, it may be okay, but it's not gonna be professional. So the difference is, we're at WordCamp, I love WordPress, everything in my business is about WordPress, but WordPress is just one tool that I've used over the last 25 years to build websites. I'm in the business not of building WordPress websites, I'm in the business of helping clients communicate effectively to their constituency on the web in such a way that it creates conversion for them. WordPress today, I think, is the very best tool to do that. If you want to use Wix or Squarespace, that's fine. Find somebody else. But if you try to build a Wix or Squarespace site, you're not going to get the same kind of results you're going to get from having a professional web developer who understands the, how these things work build the site for you. Also, SEO on Wix sucks. It's like awful. Right there. Um, so you've done web coding as well as um uh, WordPress, which is more of a, um, of a building thing than the back end stuff. Um, what made you decide that WordPress was the best way to go? And did you find that your experience with coding uh, improved your understanding of WordPress? Or things Great like question. Okay, so for the video, the question is, how did I make the move from just building straight up websites into WordPress? 
and did understanding having a background help in WordPress. First of all, I would never call myself a coder. I know enough PHP for self-defense. Uh, I, I hire the coding piece out if it gets really complicated. Um, so, did it help? Absolutely, because I mean, you gotta know HTML and CSS to just build, I mean, no matter what you're using. The reason I moved to WordPress is that more and more of my clients wanted to be able to log in and make small changes themselves. Uh, I've got a great story about that I can tell, I just don't have time now, but it, I had to make a, a continental shift in the way my business was structured from a few clients with large retainers hiring me to make all the edits into more clients with smaller retainers, which is a much better way to do things. You seem to have a lot of experience moving around the country going to work camps. Uh, in your advice of working with clients, one thing I found really important is the regional differences in how you interact with clients. For instance, here in New Mexico, small town, trust, super important. That's, maybe that's part of your chemistry section. Big part of trust. Sitting down and talking for an hour about the weather or whatever they want to talk about is really important so they to but I wonder how would you talk about this, the regional differences across the country that you see that are important? It's a great question, uh, and for the video, the question was about regional differences and how you deal with clients, and maybe it does take time to talk about the weather, um, you know, to build chemistry. You know your region, you know your area. Uh, I think in the big picture, what you're trying to do is not waste a ton of time. So, may, you know, if in your world it does take, you know, half hour, 45 minutes to build that chemistry before you get in, maybe your client consultations are two hours instead of one hour. But I would still put limits around them because otherwise there are certain clients who will talk your ear off and never give you a dime. That's a great question. Two minutes, one more question. Anybody? Right here. How do you go about pricing? <laughs> In two minutes, really? Okay, so the question is, how do you do with pricing? So um, let me sum it up with this. If you talk to anybody anywhere who tells you they've got you their pricing figured out, be suspicious. Uh, I'll tell you, I've been doing this for 20, since 1995, 22 and a half years now, and I still struggle with pricing. I price some a little too much, I price some a little too low, it all comes out, I get better over time. There is no secret formula to pricing. Uh, what, you, you know, what I would tell you to do is just ask people what they're charging for websites. Ask people, you know, other freelancers, people you meet at a meetup, ask them what they're charging. Uh, you know, the other thing is, look, uh, generally speaking, there are three price ranges in any market. There's the college kid who can do it for, you know, low money. There's the agency who's going to be 10 grand plus to walk in the door. And you can usually find a really nice, happy medium in the middle somewhere to, to price your work. That's a great question. More, to, more, more of an answer than I have time for at the moment. But let's talk after. I'd love to. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, find me on nathaningram.com and training.ithemes.com. Thanks very much.